Okay, you may wonder why I'm wearing a backpack, and that'll probably become a little bit more obvious later on. Okay, so, um, right, see if we've got this going. Oh, no. Any got a, anybody got a civil defence solution? <laughs> no. Might be a battery. Oh, the green light's gone. Oh, it's the other way around. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> oh well, I'll have to rewrite my bio now, won't I? <laughs> okay. Right, Wanganui. Um, we're located on the, the west coast of the North Island. Um, we have a major river that runs through our district, um, which you'll see causes some issues at times. Uh, our population, around about 48,000, um, most of that within our, our urban area. Okay, natural disaster risks. Uh, you know, we're pretty familiar in Wanganui with things like flooding. You know, there's, there's quite a long history of the river flooding in Wanganui, so we have a, a pretty good handle on, you know, when the river is getting high, we know pretty much within a certain amount of time, it's going to flood somewhere down, downstream. That'd be right, eh, Daryl? Yeah. Um, so yeah, we've got lots of documented footage of, of those sorts of events. The thing that goes alongside those, those are, are slips. And slips can also cause other problems, like demolishing cables. Like, hopefully you'll be able to see, there's kind of a little cable that's just hanging down in there in that dropout. All right, so, not, not only do slips destroy roads, but they actually destroy some of your communication infrastructure. All right. Volcanic eruptions. Yep, we're sitting sort of on the coast there. We've got a set of mountains inland. We've got a set of mountains up in Taranaki. They're all active. All right. They may not look very active, but they actually are. All right. Previously, um, I'm not sure when that photo was taken above uh, uh, the Whakapapa village there, but uh, that eruption caused an ash cloud that spread over quite a large area of, of the North Island. And of course we're on the coast, so tsunami is another risk, yep. Um, and of course we've got detailed evacuation zones and things like that. And of course, being in New Zealand, everybody knows about earthquakes in New Zealand. We have high risk. Um, we're probably overdue for a decent sized earthquake. Um, we've had lots of little ones. Um, this photo here is from our, our water tower, uh, which is basically a concrete structure. Um, and then you see there's big chunks of concrete that fell off it after the last reasonable sort of shake. So that leads us into our council building. So this was built in 1968. Uh, the civil defense headquarters is up on level three there somewhere. Um, and our server room is on the ground floor of that same part of the building. Now that happens to have 57% compliance with the national building standard, which isn't that great when you think about an earthquake. Okay, but it's okay because the councillors and the IT and the HR, they're all okay because they're on the outside parts. All right, so it's just the rest of council that has to worry. All right. One thing we've noted with recent events um, that have happened around New Zealand over the last couple of years, and this is sort of probably a little bit my opinion more than anything, but it's, it's based on fact, to be honest. There is an over-reliance on online services. What does that mean? Well, if we have a look at our civil defence organisations in New Zealand, they primarily use Microsoft Teams and ArcGIS Online. There's an obvious sort of thing there that maybe could affect those. If you don't have internet, you could be a bit screwed. Okay, Starlink. Starlink will solve everything, and maybe it will. But it's not infallible, okay? It can actually be affected in heavy storms. Um, volcanic ash falls can eat your dishes. Okay, it's a, uh, another one of those things that's affected by solar flares, but then most things are. Uh, here, here's a good example. Um, Wanganui River flooded in 2015. Um, that, was, that was a pretty major flood of the river itself, but there were also major road closures caused by slips. 
Um, it was classified, I think, as an 85-year flood event. Um, and reasonably significant damage, 120 properties were flooded. Um, but the big one, internet access unavailable for three days for the district. Think about that, three days. All right. But it's not all bad. All right, we don't have snakes and we don't have crocodiles, so <laughs> excellent. <laughs> okay. So anyway, this got me thinking. Okay, if we, if we don't have internet, how are we going to do half of the things that we need to do during a response to some disaster? Right, okay, we can do a standalone GIS. We've got all this lovely open source stack. We can make it standalone. All right, and here it is. We've got a kit, which is basically a nice high-end laptop, uh, an Android tablet for doing a bit of field work, a um, little Wi-Fi router, okay? Um, why do we need that? Um, so we can create a little private network, so we can do things like sync the tablet and so on and so on. Uh, and there's a bunch of miscellaneous accessories like cables and what have you. So the only one thing that they're really, really reliant on is having a single 240 volt PowerPoint. Okay, so generally we've got that because we've got some sort of generator going with a bit of luck. Okay, okay so myself and Daryl, we each have one of these packs. Uh, I update mine on a Friday. Daryl updates his on a Thursday. So with a bit of luck, they're not in the same place at the same time, um, in case one of us gets run over by a bus or happens to be in the uh, server room when the building collapses. Um, and essentially, we do weekly maintenance on these, these setups. So there's updates that come from our core GIS, so scripted routines to push our databases across, uh, some pre-prepared PDF documents and that sort of thing. Um, and we run through a weekly checklist to make sure everything's a-OK -okay in the kit, you know, uh, is everything charged, um, is everything working? Okay, the software and the applications. Um, so Windows laptop, that's cool. So we've got things like uh, an Apache web server set up on there. We've got PostGIS for our databases. We've got QGIS for our desktop and we've got QField for um, that mobile stuff. Bunch of services running around the edges of that. Uh, Tomcat running our web viewer. Uh, which is Map Store and our services on GeoServer. Uh, and then a whole lot of Dockerized containers that um, give us some other services that are really handy, like QField Cloud for syncing, uh, Valhalla for some routing and isochrone type generation, a reporting, uh, a CAN board for using the task management, and a, and a wiki as an operator's manual. Okay, so we have a, like an operator's manual that tells us what we're going to do at the beginning of an event. Um, if I'm there, there's a certain process to go. If both Daryl and I are there, there's, a, there's another slightly different process we go through. Um, if neither of us are there, it doesn't really matter. Um, the GIS viewer, um, same as pretty much what we've got internally, it just has a civil defense focus. So we've got predefined viewers set up for flooding and um, earthquake and tsunami and all those sorts of things. So we can quite quickly run up what we need. Of course, we've got QGIS desktop um, to help us maintain data coming in and out. Uh, we use Valhalla for uh, routing and isochrones, and, and there's a lovely plugin for QGIS that allows us to do all that routing uh, information and isochrones actually in QGIS and produce output. Uh, we use Canboard as a, as a task management system, so um, that's a nice, easy way for us to keep track of requests that are actually coming to us as a GIS team. Now that's not only important during an event to keep track of everything, it's actually also important after the event for um, post-event auditing and seeing what was actually done, where were the holdups, those sorts of things. Okay, so it's actually, it doesn't seem like much, but it's actually quite an important thing. We have some pre-prepared PDF documents. Um, so typically there are things like um, uh, evacuation sheets um, for parts that we know flood, things like that, um, there's a bunch of pre-prepared information. Field work. Um, so again, we're using QField for our, our field work, um, and essentially because we've got a standalone system with its own private Wi-Fi network, um, we've got a private cloud sync for, for QField Cloud. 
And so that means that you can take a tablet out, come back in, sync it back with our system, and we can do whatever we need to do with it. All right. I think that's about it. Is there any questions? <laughs> I'm sure we've got plenty of questions for time. Where do we start? Okay, there's an example of the, uh, the Wi-Fi router. It doesn't need its own power. Um, so basically it plugs in by USB straight into our laptop and that's our, our private network. Okay, so still only got that one power point. Um, nice and happy. Uh, I was just going to ask, um, have you had the need to use this since you set it up, or have you been avoiding most of the disasters? Uh, not yet. Um, so having said that, we've only had it up and running for, what, a month? Probably about a month. Um, so we, we're just waiting for an event, you know, it's like, come on, guys. <laughs> <laughs> It'll be when you're on yeah. leave, right? Actually, it's quite funny. Our, our two civil defence guys, you know, they, they have the nicknames Doom and Gloom. <laughs> so I think we're rapidly going to sort of get the same nicknames, unfortunately. <laughs> so what does happen if there's a problem down there right now? Uh, right now, um, I would be contacted. Um, if they can get me down there, that's cool. Um, depends a lot on what kind of disaster it is. Um. <laughs> Hello. Uh, great talk. It's really, really interesting. Yeah. Um, one thing I was wondering about, you mentioned you've got that, the uh, Wi-Fi router and the potential lack of, it, of internet access mm. um, in an emergency situation. Um, and you mentioned Starlink, which was interesting. I hadn't really thought of using that. Um, yeah. But what is there usually often considerable issue with traditional satellite-based internet through inter um, cell service providers? And would it be okay. useful in the context of your packages to have maybe a, uh, um, a, a cheap smartphone with an unlimited data plan or something, mm. or potentially a, an, an arrangement with the data providers for yep. civil emergency free data access? So if you've got satellite, that's, that's fine. Um, the trouble is, like, when you're talking about cell networks, um, a lot of those are connected to the internet nowadays. You get some sort of internet outage because there's been a slip, it's taken out the fibre cable site supplying Whanganui. None of that cell stuff is going to work either. So we're making an assumption that we're going to have the bare minimum to work off, which will hopefully will be just power. <laughs> yeah. If we haven't got power, we're, you know, oh well. <laughs> yeah. Yes? What sort of work do you imagine doing in an emergency event with your kits? Right, that's a good What's question. like a typical kind of request that you might get? Yep. Okay, so um, part of what we're doing is obviously collecting field work information. All right, so whether that's off paper-based stuff that's, that's supplied into us or via those Qfield mobiles. So we've got to record that. Uh, and when, when we've got this thing up and running, you know, we can connect into a Wi-Fi enabled television and put up a dashboard in the civil defence headquarters, even if it's in a tent. Okay, so, so that's part of it. Part of it is, um, and we've found this over a number of years, Daryl especially, he's been involved in civil defence for 40 odd years. Um, is there's always a need for paper output, all right? So one thing I haven't done yet is decide on how we're going to have some sort of printing capability, but that'll come. Mm. Oh, thank you very much, Simon. Um, do you operate under the AIMS structure uh, for emergency management, and how do you log everything? Um, do, you, know, you, you said you had the Kanban board there, yep. but how, how do you actually log in a, an incident management log? Well, assuming, assuming that um, we had internet connectivity, we would be doing it through the, the normal sort of civil defence routines, which are via uh, Microsoft Teams, yeah, which is a shambles. <laughs> anyway. The other thing on the uh, West Island we find is that uh, as the fires go up the hill, mm -hmm. uh, what do we put under the top of the hills? Um, the cell towers. So exactly. guess what? Disappears first. Yep. Uh, we have no connectivity in there. Yeah, many, many years ago too, uh, there was major snowfall down in the South Island and the cell phone towers actually lasted for a little while, um, but of course their battery backups ran out pretty quickly. So 
you know, even if you have cell phone coverage for a little while at the start of the event, there's no guarantee it's going to be there for, for when you need it. Mm. Hello. Uh, excellent talk. Uh, just wondering, uh, well, so many questions, but <laughs> uh, power in terms of uh, using a hand crank, for example, <laughs> uh, falling back to things like uh, radio or um, yep. Yep. low... Uh, no, low power I, solutions like that? I think I'll put Daryl on a bicycle or something and, and, and I'll be doing the GIS work and he'll be pedaling his heart out. <laughs> um, yeah, no, as, as long as we've got some sort of um, 240 volt supply from a single power outlet, it doesn't really matter what it is, whether it's a diesel generator or uh, some sort of battery system. I think we, we, we have a number of um, Toyota RAV4s in, in the council and, and they have 240 volt plugs in them. So, so worst case scenario is we can work in the back of one of the RAV4s. <laughs> but I like your idea of the bicycle, that's good, yeah. <laughs> I was just reflecting on what you said about how you've kind of like built all of this up so that it, there's a lot more resilience in your system. Mm. What did you do in previous disasters? Like, was there Panic. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, like in previous disasters, um, I think in the 2015 flood, and Daryl will tell me um, whether I'm wrong or not, um, there was actually back to paper based systems because that's all we had. We've got topo maps currently up in the civil defence headquarters that we want to um, update because they're about 10 years old. So, yeah, um, it's an ongoing thing. Yeah. Yes. Um, I was attending a conference last year on imaging spatial uh, imaging spatial professionals in Auckland last year. Yeah. And one of the presentations made was by Niva, and it uh, showed that how they are modelling climate change, the effects of climate change. Mm -hmm. And one of the areas which will get affected the most are the shorelines, the, yes. place, the si towns and cities most next to the sea. So I was just wondering whether the, your decisions on preparedness are based on uh, in, co co in response to those uh, preparedness for the climate change? Or yeah, um, definitely. So there's definitely a need to update things like tsunami zones and things like that because uh, you, you're going to get sea level rise, that kind of stuff. Um, but beyond that, um, we also have quite a large river that comes down through our district that brings a lot of silt down. Every time it floods, it's silting that river up. All right? So the actual bed of the river is slowly rising. All right? So you think in 20 years' time, after you know, a few more events, we could actually potentially have much worse flooding or a similar rainfall to what we had in 2015. Mm. Mm. Hey, um, how shall I put this? So the rest of New Zealand roads all kind of ESRI platform support and yeah, so Yeah, who cares about them? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But <laughs> my question was, does it ever get lonely? Like, because you are out there on the edge. <laughs> I've got this great bunch of phosphor G people right here. I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm not lonely. But, 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 but kind of from a... a um, no, literally, we, um, our civil defence guys do have an AGOL licence, all right? Um, what tends to happen with that though is we, we will consume those that um, AGOL feed down into our, our system. Yeah. Yeah. So. And the level of support, you know, so uh, Eagle has its kind of emergency management team all fly in and save the day on that kind of stuff. Do you still kind of get that level of support? Well, the interesting thing is it would be interesting to, to sort of ask what the support was like yeah. during Cyclone Gabriel. 
<laughs> Dear. <laughs> mm. <laughs> yeah. Anyway. <laughs> we got one more question over there. Uh, double dipping. Um, the, just remind me, of just simple critical infrastructure and the larger conversation, what's New Zealand? Is New Zealand ready? <laughs> <laughs> or is it just Wanganui? <laughs> We're ready for crocodiles and snakes. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, it, it, because civil defence is very much, uh, what would you say, it's, it's kind of, there's district level of, of um, civil defence and then a regional level, and then beyond that there's like fire and emergence in New Zealand. Uh, my opinion is the coordination isn't that great. The choices in what sort of systems they use haven't been that great. Um, so, you know, if, if you were looking at our Microsoft Teams setup, um, it's like Stacey Rendell's um, uh, presentation the other day on smelly spreadsheets. Um, uh, that Teams system has just grown into this abomination. It's, it's really hard to find stuff in there. <laughs> so, are we ready? Probably not. If we had a major earthquake in New Zealand, uh, like Christchurch, um, you'd probably have much the same issues as what were happening back then, to be honest. People wouldn't, wouldn't like me saying that, but I think that's pretty true. <laughs> yeah. Okay, well, uh, thanks again, Simon. All right. <laughs> <laughs> you can keep that in your, in your laptop bag. <laughs> yeah.